All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michael is joined by a couple of guests right now uh, to talk the French Open. The uh, end of the tournament, 2023 Roland Garros, Prakash Armitage, Mr. Worldwide is back in the States. Well, let's start there. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. But uh, who else do I have the pleasure of speaking with? My play- Well, listen, this is not his first time on Tennis Channel. We all know Jonah, a.k.a. Pup Daddy. Uh, you know, with his dad, P. Diddy, you know, P. Diddy and Pup Daddy, that's how we do it. So just in case I get lost on any of my thoughts, he's just going to help me out. Isn't that right, buddy? Yeah, I think I think that's going to be the way it works, Prakash. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've heard people on the street saying that you've gotten a little softer since you got that dog. I don't know. It's kind of taking the edge off. Is that Not true? even close. Not even close. <laughs> you know, so I got to find the edge so, some way, somehow. It's, it's well, hey, uh, you've been as busy as anyone in tennis media, not just the first week of the French Open as you literally just got back, but on the lead up all the way through all the desks, our great producer, Ian Panda, Ian Dunn, outlined how many interviews you did. It was over 100 in that in the course of all that time. And, you know, have you gotten a chance to take a step back and catch your breath? Because that was, you know, it's fun. Obviously, you enjoy what you're doing. We can all see it with you. But that's a lot of work night in, night out. You know, it's wild, man. Anytime someone someone makes the analogy to work, it's so weird for, for me to even think about it that way because it's, it, like you said, I, I, I love every aspect of it, you know? I mean, I, I, this is the sport that, you know, basically gave me my whole life. So, you know, to be involved in it in, at a high level is, is a gift. And then, you know, I'm, I just, I came to the conclusion, you know, a long time ago that I just, I just want to be inspired. I want to be inspired and I want to inspire. So as long as I'm somehow in the vicinity of inspiration, I'm, I'm living, living my purpose. I'm living, I'm living my best life. And look, we're around these amazing warriors on the men's and women's side all day long. And what's my job? I get to, I get to talk to them and, and pull out how they are the way they are. So these are the conversations I would be having if I was sitting with them at dinner. You know, there just happens to be a camera there. So it, you know, it kind of, the process fuels the process. Yeah, I know. It makes sense. And it's just also good to humanize these players and not just the very top. The chance to interview match winner after match winner gives a chance to some people that, you know, aren't bigger names in the grand scheme of things, but are getting there in a lot of cases. Some of the players that have broken through, you know, your media interviews were the first times really anyone had ever heard of them. Yeah, I mean, look, one that comes to mind and look, we're going to obviously be seeing from her at the highest levels of the game for the next, you know, 15, 15 years is Mira Andrieva. Yeah. You know, I, I was I think I was really the first one to have some kind of a significant sit down with her in Madrid and what happened? The first time we sat down together, she basically went viral for how charming she was, her her Andy Murray response and and being there to be able to, you know, bring that out of them is it's it's such a what a moment that was. You know, I mean I, I that that genuine reaction you saw from me was how everyone felt in the moment when they were able to hear her speak. Born in 2007 just seems weird. I'm still getting used to that. <laughs> no, no, don't even, don't even. You know, when, when I was on the desk with, yeah. with Steve and Chanda in, in Paris, Weissman said, yeah, you know, we're going to preview this next match, Coco Golf, Mira Andreva, you know, together. They, they're, they're, they're combined age is 35 years old. I said, get out of here, Weissman. Get out, that's depressing. Go to the, go to the next segment. You know? uh, yeah, it had to. That was uh, not the proper perspective there, but no, it, it was uh, a great showing for you and for the entire, entire Tennis Channel team. Roland Garros 2023, we only have a couple matches left. Semis for both. Women's yep. semis Thursday as this episode drops. Men's semis will be on Friday. And look, we can start with it. We finally got the match we wanted and we've been desiring on the men's side. Carlos Alcaraz will be playing Novak Djokovic in a best of five match. Second time in their career. It's going to happen in the semifinals on Friday. We've all been savor- savoring over this. They haven't. They've been like two ships, Prakash, crossing in the night haven't really touched it that much on court and here it comes i, I want to start with this carlos alcaraz has been making very good players not look very good it's very remarkable how untouchable he's looked going through shapovalov musetti and Sitsipas, and doing it flawlessly is as good of a run to a semi as i can remember seeing yeah look by by, by a long shot i mean when he's playing his peak tennis which we saw for the first whatever, 90 minutes of that Tsitsipas match, 6-1, 6-2, 5-2, 40-15, before, you know, Steph crawled his way back a little bit. As he said, that was the best tennis of his entire career. You know, you you start to think of uh, Roger in his heyday. 
And, and I say Roger in his heyday as opposed to uh, Novak or Rafa in his prime because Novak and Rafa won in different ways. You know, Roger, it was a little bit like Carlos where he just, he blows you off the court. You know, it's magnificent to watch. Winners are just flying from every aspect of the court. So personally, as a fan, it's, it's glorious. That's the kind of tennis I love to watch. I, I will say, though, for, for as brilliantly as he played, and this is taking nothing away from him because, look, I've been very vocal about how he is just my favorite guy to watch, not just because of his tennis, but because of his energy as well. It really makes you feel like, like impossible is, is possible with this kid. But those three matches you pointed out, all three players with one-handed backhands. And the way that Carlos plays, especially with that magnificent kick serve and the way he gets the ball high up and earns that short ball, it, it, it's, it's going to be tough to see a one-hander beat him, you know, especially, yeah. especially on a clay court. But um, he's been playing exceptional tennis. you got to think coming into this match, he's, he's probably in better form than, mm-hmm. than Novak is. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, Novak's got all three things going. You know, he's got the, the, uh, the head and the heart the tennis, but also the experience. Mm. So I, I'm, I think it's a very even match going into this. I, I cannot wait to see what happens. Right. And we know one thing in tournaments and also with Novak and the all-time greats is that they ramp it up towards the big matches, which is <laughs> very important. Again, take nothing away from Carlos Alcaraz, what he's done, but you can't just compare scores and resumes once you get there. It's an entirely different match when these guys lock up. That, that said, Novak is doing what he does, right? Which is get better every match as we get into the later stage of this tournament. Hatchinoff was the one where it started out sluggish in the first set. Hatchinoff is such a fighter. He plays so well in big moments, but it was vintage Novak, right? Like in a tie break, 7-0, no unforced errors, turned it up when he needed to. And again, you mentioned the experience. I just look at the mental strength this guy has in big moments, and we take it for granted how he's just so consistent when it matters the most. Yeah, I mean, look, that match is a perfect example because, again, in patches, he was excellent tennis-wise, but all the way through, he was brilliant mentally. You know, after he lost that first set 7-6, you know, Jim Courier, who was doing the match, said, okay, check out Novak on the changeovers right now. He's icing himself down. He's preparing for a longer match because Novak knows this mental and spiritual pacing of the best of five sets. He's like, all right, I lost the first set. I'm just going to have to pace it for a bit longer. Turned it up in that second, but then all of a sudden, cruises through the third, and even when Hatchinoff made a comeback there in the fourth to get the four all, eight straight points in a row, you know? That's that's calling upon what he needs when he needs it. Now, going into this Alcaraz match, I will say one thing. Novak talked about it before the tournament, and then and then I brought it up again when when uh, he came to the PC desk in Paris. By the way, check out that interview. Uh, myself, Steve, and Novak. It was an unbelievable piece. Go check it out. Novak in, yeah. in the finest form, as he, as he always is at our desk. I asked him about the fact that he gave a quote saying, to play Rafa here at the French, that you know, I've beaten him a couple of times, but I've literally had to leave my heart and my guts out on the court. Now, it's one thing for a, a player to talk about that. It's another thing to have actually experienced it. There are lots of players who can go through 15 years on the tour, play seven, six in the fifth, all sorts of different tight matches, Davis Cup, whatever, but may not have actually left their heart and guts out on the court. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's almost like an out-of-body experience, which you need to almost do once to know w- what it takes to actually give of yourself to it. You know, it's almost like that. And look, I speak in, in film terms all the time because, look, it's always been film and tennis for me. It's almost like that, you know, Rocky IV scene where he tells Adrian, you know, uh, he's, he, I'm going to be willing to die out there. And he's going to have to be willing to die himself to be able to stand there against me. That's that sort of next, next, next level of competitive drive and heart. And the the fact that Novak has that in him and knows how to go there, I think is going to be very interesting in this match. I want to see when he pushes Carlos to that absolute limit, Mm -hmm. how Carlos responds. I have no doubt that Carlos is not going to fold, but... To see both of them give that, yeah. I think that's what that's what we're all here for. It's uncharted territory for Carlos. We're not doubting him. It is just a new terrain that Novak has made his Hall of Fame resume in. So it's fair. Correct. I also think it's fair that, I mean, the odds shape up with Carlos Alcaraz as a <coughs> sizable, not overwhelming, but a sizable favorite. And I do think that is fair. Like, I, I also say that Novak as an underdog, it doesn't happen much. So count him out at your own peril. But fascinating I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a gambler and i yeah. don't I, you know i don't put money on sports yeah. because i've played sports so i know yeah. the wild uh-huh. 
ish that can happen in sports. Yep. But if, if you ever find Novak as an underdog yep. for anything, you take whatever money you don't mind losing and you, you, you throw it on him, you know? Right. And, and you know that tactically why this is so fascinating is that Novak is studying exactly different patterns. He's, he's got one of the best analytical minds in tennis. So he's yeah. got him and his team working on ways to solve a problem that is, is pretty tough in tennis wise, but what can you do to hurt out? <laughs> so what tactically would you expect Novak to do and his approach in this match? Well, look, uh, you know, when Carlos is playing well, you, you don't really see any weaknesses, but you know, Nick Kyrgios put out a tweet recently saying, you know what, you, you will see the weaknesses when someone finally exposes them. Right. But it's going to be much, it's going to be much tougher to do it. Roger was, was giving Leighton Hewitt six love sets in the final of grand slams. But then, you know, it took Rafa to come and do what he did, you know, getting that high, heavy ball to his back and as only Rafa could do to expose that, right? And then, and then Fed had to go to a new level and improve that backhand and it goes back and forth. Here, um, I think we're going to see Novak try to get Carlos to play a few more forehand down the lines than he's used to. Um, Carlos does such a great job, you know, hooking at cross court, opening up the court. And then, you know, he, and he can go anywhere with the forehand, but you know, I think Jim pointed this out uh, uh, during Miami. He hasn't been forced to go there on, on the crucial moments when, when things are on the line and perhaps when, when he's a little bit under pressure. You know, he does everything so well, but perhaps that's the shot that is slightly weaker than some of the others. And Novak is so good at the baseline, he can contort the rhythms of the rallies and the patterns in order to get you to hit your worst shot. So. Yeah. So I think that'll be interesting. I think Novak is going to adjust his positioning on the serve, this kick serve that has worked so well for Carlos in the last few matches against the opponents that you mentioned. I don't think it's going to work as well against Novak because Novak is going to be able to step up in the court and take that earlier with the two-hander. So mm -hmm. I think a couple of adjustments like that. Um, and then, you know, I'd also be curious to see the length of the rallies. In, in the last match, I forget if it was the last match, one of the more recent matches with Carlos, even though he's been winning fairly comfortably, five balls and less, Carlos was just completely dominating the rallies. But when it went to nine or 10 balls or more, his percentage went down a little bit. And, and those were against opponents who were worse than Novak. Novak is one of the best players we've ever seen in history at these long gut-busting rallies. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very curious to see what kind of tone Novak sets from the beginning. Is he going to uh, let Carlos know, listen, you're going to have to play 15 ball rallies and hit those spectacular winners that you hit, but on the 14th and 15th ball, as opposed to the second or third ball. I think that would be really interesting because if Novak's able to do that over the course of five sets, I wonder how Carlos will respond to that. I can't wait to see it. They're both in good form and they're both healthy, which is a huge thing too. We had doubts yeah. there, uh, the forehand up the line point. That's a, that's a good one because it made me think of, you know, one of the few times we've seen him lose in the last few years was against Rafa at Indian Wells. And I feel like Rafa kind of targeted that as well. So yeah, can't wait to see it. Um, more with Prakash Armitage here on tennis channel inside in talking about Roland Garros 2023, the other men's semifinal set up today. We got the matchups set in stone. Alexander Zverev back in the semifinals, same place as last year, along with a returning face last year's finalist, Casper Ruud, who knocks off his Danish counterpart, Holger Runa, in four sets. Starting with Zverev, Prakash, what a year and what a journey it's been for him. And here he is, one year after one of the most graphic and unfortunate injuries we've seen in a tennis court, all that time off, all that struggling mentally and physically, and he finds a way to get back into the Roland Garros semifinals. It's a remarkable journey that... In a Roland Garros with a lot of storylines, I don't think he's getting enough proper perspective. No, look, there are a lot of things when you talk about Sasha Zverev. Um, you know, first, <laughs> there's the whole there's the whole PTSD of it from what happened last year. I mean, that was such a violent injury. That was one of the worst things I have seen on a tennis court, period. And then not to mention, look at the form that he was in. He was playing such phenomenal tennis. Rafa was playing well at Roland Garros. Three hours, and, and we didn't even play two sets. That's how good those guys were. And mind you, as well as Rafa was playing, Sasha could have won that match. Sasha could have won that match. Sasha could have, he, he could have definitely beaten Rude, possibly, in the final. Sasha, Sasha could have worked his way to number one in the world. There were a lot of ifs there, right? So there's that. And then the fact that 
you know, you got to be able to come back from this injury on an ankle. Let, let's not forget, tennis players, they're aggressive movers out there. You know, it takes a long time. One, you can get healthy and run around at full speed, but to move that violently again on a tennis court, you got to be able to have that faith again and that trust again without every single time you go for a ball that worry of, oh my God, it might happen again. That's a big hump to get over. You know, I, I remember, you know, many years ago, I had a left wrist surgery and, you know, you, you know, you're supposed to let it go on the backhand, right? But it took me like, even when I was healthy, like, like six months, I was just like stiff arming it, you know, because I just couldn't let it go. I was so, I was so worried about it. So, you know, magnify this on, on the, on that, on that foot. Um, so he's had to get over that. Then of course, you know, Sasha has had to deal with a lot of stuff off court as well. And, you know, that's, that's never easy, regardless of, you know, what the circumstances are, whether, whether um, you know, however you got there, that's never easy to deal with. Then you look at the tennis aspect of it. I don't care how well you're practicing. It takes a long time to get that match, match confidence back. I spoke to him in Rome and I said, Sash, you're right there, man. It's just going to take one more match. You know, we were in the players restaurant. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that one match was supposed to have been in Indian Wells against Medvedev. It was supposed to have been in Monte Carlo against Medvedev. Medvedev. You know, it's, it's that one match. It's that one match. It's not coming. But he kept with it. You know, as bad as he was feeling, he said, in practice, I'm not, I'm not losing sets. I haven't right. lost a practice set in months. And then for him to slowly get over the hump in the week before Roland Garros. And then here, you know, you got to give him so much credit because, you know, a champion really turns it on when he needs to. If he lost his points, he'd be looking at possibly being outside the top 100. So he's got to be feeling super, super confident about what he was able to pull out of himself even thus far in the tournament. You mentioned uh, eloquently <laughs> how it's just one little hesitation thought of I'm not fully back. And at this level, at the very best, that's the difference in everything. If you're a half step slow or just unsure of yourself, that could be catastrophic at this level. Also, his mindset and that story you just told me, that shows you what his expectations are of himself. Like we all see, wow, this is a great player. He's already back in the top 30. He's making moves. He's like, no, I know where I've been and what I can get to. And I need to get there. And it came together. So I'm, I'm, you know, happy to see him back where he belongs at the top of the men's game. Playing a guy in Casper Root, if you talk about like, this is the Rodney Dangerfield of men's tennis, this guy just doesn't get his proper respect. We're talking That's 86. Hilarious. We're That's talking hilarious. 80, for gosh, we're talking 86 clay court wins since 2020. And people are like, man, it's Casper Root again. I don't know. Let's, let's put Holger in. Let's put Sinner in. Here's Casper Root again, men's semifinal of Roland Garros and looking, looking fresh as ever. While you made a Rodney Dangerfield comparison, I understand where you went with that. I don't know personality-wise if there's a further further okay. comparison. Yeah. We're, talking to tennis. Casper. we're talking tennis arts, you know. We're 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 staying there. Um, no, Casper's look, game on clay. You, you know his off season. He's been the most critical of it more than anybody else. That hey, I mismanaged it. Didn't get off to the best start. He's found a way to revive his yep. season at his most comfortable <laughs> events. So props to him for that. I actually think he's playing better tennis than when he made the final last year, because, you know, when you go through the off season and then, and then the first part of the year that he had, you know, you, you start developing a little, I mean, look, tennis players, you know, you can be super confident, then you can be super insecure. You, you develop this little, I got to prove people wrong type thing. So in a way, you know, maybe he was able to use this as fuel. And, uh, you know, so many people talk about the other players, as you pointed out, maybe that's another thing that fuels him, you know? He's like, you know, I'm so well behaved. I go about my business. I'm a gentleman out there. And why am I not getting as much as much acclaim and credit as, you know, these other people who are just, you know, being wild and crazy and all this stuff. So maybe that's another thing that fuels him. Having said that, let's go to the tennis now. So that, that, that's part of what may be fueling him mentally. But tennis wise, he said a couple of weeks ago, maybe a few weeks ago, you know, I've been a little bit complacent on the court. Sometimes I can get a bit too defensive. I asked him this when he came on our, our tennis channel desk. And he said, I need to be more aggressive because the best players in the world are hyper aggressive out there. So I think he's had to get a little bit out of his comfort zone to get more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And the one constant that I've been seeing, actually, even in that semifinal that he lost to Holger Rune in, uh, in Rome, that yeah. first set and a half, some of the best tennis I've seen. It was exceptionally oh, aggressive, even though he lost that match. Here, during the French, uh, during Roland Garros, he's been so aggressive. He has been pummeling that forehand with, with, with so much spin on the ball. It's 
it, it's one of the heaviest things I've seen. If you take away Rafa's forehand, you really got to look at Rude's as probably the heaviest one out there. Not, not I'm talking about speed wise, like Carlos, right. but heaviest. His backhand, I feel like, has improved, and he's serving very clutch. He's his getting toss, a lot more. He's getting a lot more free great. points. Yeah. His toss looks great. He's getting a lot more free points on big points. So a lot of this stuff is coming together, and he's just looking more like a. Like today, when I watched that match against um, uh, against oh, against Holger, he just looks like, you know, I've been here. <laughs> this is where I belong. I'm 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 going for a slam. You know, he just looks like he's carrying a different body language around him too. His positivity, whether it's understated or you know less vocal than most, it, it puts him in a good place to deal with. You know, raucous crowd. Holger makes his move. Everyone wants to see more tennis, and he's fine yep. to deal with it. He put some of those forehands in the short court today, and it was as heavy as I've seen it. It's it's so fun to watch his development, his maturity, and what he's done to get here for Holger. I think Jim Courier said it best. No surprise there, but I think he said it best. Like he's going to learn from this. Like there were moments. It's those dips in the game. It's <laughs> I don't want to say checking out, but it's moments where his level drops, and you know there's things he can improve on, which is a good place to be in when you have all that talent, and you're already a top 10 player, but this process, it, it shows you the levels, right. To get to this very top of the mountain. He played so well, he fought so hard, but there are things to work on. I think we saw that exposed a little bit today. Yeah, we did. And also, uh, and look, I say this with, with the greatest amount of respect because I think Holger is going to win multiple grand slam titles. Okay. That's how good I think he is. And what he's done already has spoken for itself. Quite frankly, he could have had a Monte Carlo title under his belt a Munich title and a finals in Rome. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how good he was. He was a couple points, a few points away in, in Monte Carlo. Today he looked like a 20 year old out there. You know, he looked like he needed a bit more experience. When Carlos is out there at the moment, Carlos looks like he's like he's 25, like he's 26, like he's been around, you know. Holger, I just think needs a little bit more experience. He's got all the game. I think he can continue to develop a little bit more physically. You know, you can see Carlos is more developed mm -hmm. physically, especially in the lower body. Even though Holger looks amazing, I think he can continue to develop a little bit there. Looked a little bit weak at times, especially in that fifth set against in, in the in the previous round, um, in that spectacular match against uh, Surindolo. Um, and then and then mentally, you know, he just he looked a little out of place at times. And you know, I think we just saw a little bit of a difference in experience between him and Casper today. Mm -hmm. And that's just time. You know, the more of this Holger gets under his belt, he's just going to become stronger and stronger. It's 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 mind blowing how good he is and the belief he has in himself at twenty. So it's it, for him, it's it's a matter of time. But I I couldn't agree with Jim more. Yeah, maybe you got to get him in the in the gym. You know, that's I think that's the next logical step. I know? spoke to him in Miami. I said, Playboy, what are you doing for those legs? They're looking good. He says, You know what? I actually don't train legs. Uh -oh. I literally just play tennis and tennis and tennis and tennis, and that's that's how I train. So you know, naturally, I think he's just got these these big legs. Okay. Well, and it's, you know, I've been singing his praises the last couple of months as well. It's more staying in the fight is how I phrase it. There are times when he is trying, but he kind of goes a little wayward. I think if he cleans certain things up, it's a tough, it's a tough task right. to have to play Casper Root, who's built to go for four plus mm -hmm. hours. So uh, it'll happen. Uh, more here with Prakash Armitage on Tennis Channel Inside and the women's side. Got the final four. This will be released as the matches are taking place tomorrow morning. So we'll see how this shakes out. But You've got Igas Biontech taking on Beatrice Ed Ed Maya. You've got Arena Sabalenka taking on Mukova, who's made an improbable run as well. Two favorites are still in prime for a showdown. We've got some underdogs in here. Got to start with the defending champ, who's been just reigning supreme in Paris, Igas Biontech, going for her third Roland Garros title and little adversity thrown her way because she simply won't allow it. To watch Iga play on clay, Prakash, as she did against Coco Golf in the morning, was Simply remarkable. She's looking out there and she just, my notes for that match where she doesn't give you much of anything. Like she gives you very few openings and puts away, puts out all fires before they even ignite. There's uh, look, I, I, I'm, I'm sticking to my story that I've stuck to all year. Iga, um, Iga, Rubakina and Sabalenka are, are in a league of their own, right? Last year, Iga was really in a league of her own. And, you know, Rubakina and Sabalenka have stepped up. The only way to be able to beat Iga, there are two ways you can go about it. You can either completely out variety her with, with the most dynamic game and somehow put that all together in the course of a two out of three set match, which is not easy to do. And when I say that, I mean, you need 
Bianca Andrescu playing at at the level she like played at. Prichakova, maybe something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You need you need Andrescu playing like she played when she won the U.S. Open, mixing up the serve and volleys with the drop shots, the slices, and the power shots, and mixing it all in together. Or you need uh, Krichikova, exactly as you said, who can do the same type of thing, which we saw her do in Dubai mm-hmm. when she won and, and beat all the top three players in a row to be able to win that tournament. By the way, side note on Krichikova, man, she's a puzzler because she'll go do what she did in Dubai and then she'll throw in some stinkers, you like, know, some, some losses. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I said, oh, man, you did it again. You threw in another thinker again. She's so good. She's so fun to watch. And she's she's yeah. a real pleasure, actually, to speak to. Anyway, you got me on a side note. That's one way to beat Iga. The other way is with pure blunt force trauma, that kind of power that you got to be able to instill on her game. And the two players who I think are uh, the only two players who are capable of doing that are Sabalenka and Rabakina. Rabakina was 3-0 and against her this year. And Sabalenka has proved she can beat her on, on a clay court. They're the only ones who can keep up that kind of power over the course of three mm-hmm. sets. That final of Madrid with Sabalenka and Siantec was one of the highest quality matches. It was definitely the highest quality match I've seen this year on the mm-hmm. WTA, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. It was unbelievable to watch back and forth. Both held their nerves really well. So I think it's going to take one of them to win. Um, I called Rubakina and Sabalenka to make the final of the French. Those are my two picks. And I just I just went out on a limb because I'm like, everyone's picking Shiantic. So, you know, let me take Rabakina. She got sick, unfortunate. I thought she was gonna be it was gonna be a great match with her and Iga. Mm-hmm. They didn't get to play, so obviously I really think Iga's gonna be able to make it through. I know Bia beat her in Canada last year, but different situation on the clay. Uh, Bia's had an amazing run. I think emotionally she might be a little taxed. Iga, no one has even like stood a chance. You know, no one's gotten past four games. So yeah. I like Iga, Iga to be able to get through there. On the other side, Mukova was my dark horse to make the round of 16. She not only got there, but she's, she's made it this far. She's one of those players who can have, a, she has a lot of variety, who can mess you up in a lot of different ways, but she doesn't have that knockout punch. So that variety, I think, could have been very tricky for Sabalenka last year before she was in the physical shape she's in this year and moves around so well. I think now the fact that Sabalenka moves laterally well, moves up and down better, and is serving really well. I think that variety from Mukova is, is, is not going to be as effective. So I do like Sabalenka to come through, and I think it's going to be one, one versus two. Well, we're getting a rivalry. Uh, that's what we would all, we've all wanted for the last couple of years is let's see some rivalries on the WTA. If that's Mitch, the final. Mitch, Mitch, you want rivalry. I was in Madrid. I walked into a coffee shop. And and Arena was there with her boyfriend, and I was like, "Hey, how are you? Hey, how you doing?" We caught up, and then I'm like, "Hey, great job in uh, in Stuttgart last week." Uh, she's like, "Yeah, I know." I'm like, "No, it's okay. You gotta let some other people win. You know, you've been winning everything." She wants and that she car. Goes, well, well, yeah, exactly. But then, yeah. then she said, uh, "She's like, yeah, I know, but not her. Not her. I can't lose to her." <laughs> it's it's a good one. No, it, it's good, and I think you know for the first for the first time, I Iga had in Maya. Maya's power is good. It's not at the level, obviously, no one's as a Sabalink and Rabakina. She'd have to really redline to win this match. It's a tough ask. I do think the Sabalenka point is valid, that she's handling it. She's in physically better shape. She's also mentally handled the pressure. This is something that won her first Grand Slam, you know, going for two in a row. But also having to, have, ha- and having to handle the pressure of being the top seed on the bottom half of the draw, the two seed, and being favored in all your matches. She's done a pretty good job. Yeah, but uh, and just finishing that point on the rivalry, you know, that story I was saying, she's she's also she's handling the rivalry. She's handling all of this with like a great deal of like like fun and charm. Like even when she said what I was saying, yeah. she's, she's smiling and laughing. You know, she's she's enjoying all of this. And this comes to why I think she won the Australian Open and why she's doing so well. You know, she talked about it in Australia. You know, she's found such a great deal of, of self-love for herself, which she said wasn't there previously. So I think she's playing and making her decisions based on the right things as opposed to coming from the wrong places. Yeah. So when you talk about the pressure of being the top seed in the bottom half, I don't think she feels that as much or she's approaching it in a healthier way where it doesn't cripple her. You know, I think she looks at it like, you know what, I am the best player. And if I continue to just stick to the beliefs and the, and the way I'm going about my business, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I, I'm going to do. So I think she's in a great headspace right now, which for Arena, I really think is the most, I mean, for any player, but especially Arena who already strikes the ball so well, that's the most important thing for her. 
this surface, this tournament, Sabres ego more than, you know, Madrid was more with the elevation, how Sabalenka played. Sabalenka is going to have a chance. It's going to be tough for anybody, Sabalenka included, yep. to take that title away from Iga. The workmanlike approach, and I keep coming back to this, Prakash, her idol, Rafael Nadal, process-oriented. Iga is just so focused on the next match, the next game, the next point even, that I think that's served her well because we're all talking about her, rightfully so, like a transcendent talent. Those weight of expectations following up last year, Iga's mental side continues to shine in these moments as well. Yeah, with that, I mean, look, she's the favorite. She's for sure the favorite. I'd probably put it at 60-40 if she plays Sabalenka in the final. Um, let's not walk over the semis here because, you know, Sabalenka has a bad day. There's no reason why Mukova can't get her. And, sure. and Adad Maya, even though she has a good amount of power, she also counter punches really well. You know, she's, she's tall. She's got a good wingspan. She gets a lot of balls back in play. And if you remember in Canada last year, she got a lot of errors out of the racket of Iga. So especially as it went down to the third set, again, different conditions here, but assuming they both get through to the final, I like Iga as a 60-40 favorite, for sure. You know, I think the conditions in Paris, for sure, different than Madrid. And Sabalenka is not going to be able to fire as many winners as she did in Madrid. Maybe get as many free points on the serve as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, you know, look, Iga's, Iga's uh, you know, in, in the most beautiful, magnificent way possible. Yeah. She's a beast. He's a beast on this stuff, you know. So I had one other thing on the women's game. Uh, we're going to try to do this with video in the video uh, post to this, but... We'll play some audio now because I need to get your comment on something else that we that came to my attention. To help <laughs> to decide which one is wearing a better suit. Steve, please. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> uh, always, He's like the famous funny. star. He doesn't care about anyone. <laughs> what do we think? Guys, what do we think? you both look amazing. <laughs> Love you, all right you, so I, I had to i had to it i, I had to get like your take again. you're coming on like with again. the the minister of happiness and someone that made the quarterfinals in a run where she is admittedly not at full health i mean you can't say enough nice things about on i want to know the backstory of that moment though before we break down her tennis well she came she came to the set and first she joked she's like oh my god i get both of my guys i get both of my guys and I'm like, listen, listen, listen. I know we get a lot great, but I'm just, I'm just happy to be here with, with you and Steve because she's joked that you know Steve is a lucky charm when she when she uh, was doing so well in Charleston a couple of years ago. So we had a blast on stage. I mean, Ons and I, we get along really well. Um, I'm very close with her her um, her team as well. Stu Duguid, who runs um, uh, Naomi Osaka and and Nick Kyrgios, their agents, they've all just signed uh, Ons earlier this year. Husband Kareem. It's just it's an she's she's just amazing. And she surrounds herself with amazing people. I love being around her. And, and she just came over there and it was all fun from the start. She said, we both look great. And then at the end, she wasn't joking. I thought she was joking about the catwalk. Then she literally filmed it, like put it up and then put it up on Twitter. And started asking people, you know, oh, who looks better? You know, and it was commenting for like 10 days on that thing. Um, you know, that's what she does. She loves to, she, she, she loves to have fun. Um, every match she won in the fashion she won, honestly, Surprise me because look, when Owens is playing her best, I give her a shot to win any grand slam that she's in. You want to talk about what I said earlier, you know, slicing people up with variety and a dynamic game. That's what Owens does so well. There's not a single person in the world Owens can beat from Iga to Rabakana to, to Sabalenka. Owens has been a little bit out of the conversation because of her health, right? She had, she had a year last year that took a lot out of her. Not only did she make two slam finals, but it was, I think, more emotionally and spiritually taxing on her than a lot of other people because, you know, she was such a historic trailblazer for, for you know, Tunisia, for the whole continent of Africa, for, for just, just so many people, you know, the whole, the, whole, the whole Muslim world as well. That's a lot. That's a lot of pressure. You know, that's a lot of responsibility, all in a beautiful way. And I think it's, it's, it's a responsibility she wears magnificently well and that she was born for, but it takes a lot out of you, you know? And look, she's had to come back from some, some injury issues and so forth. So I, I had low expectations for the French. She couldn't play anything in the lead-ups, especially when she did so well last year. She won Madrid, she made the final of Rome. So you had no matches coming in. So every match she won, you know, and she was playing so well, I was pleasantly and pleasantly more surprised, you know? Then the minute I started thinking, oh, wait, you know, maybe she could, then she ran into, she ran into a really tough opponent. 
Highlight for me, though, in that match with Bia, at, first of all, Owens was no. very close. She was very close to victory. Won the first, breaker in the second. She could have taken it. What a, what a glorious hug at the end. That, and that wasn't done for everyone to see. That was done from the genuineness of our heart. That's, that is my favorite thing about but Owens. Yeah, she fought the whole way through. What were expectations based on her injuries and you know everything that's happened? Also, you can talk about rivalries. You can talk about maybe clicks developing. Who's friends <laughs> with who? Ons is like you know the the neutral one. Everyone's friends with her. Everyone likes her. She everybody know, loves her. Yeah, so everybody loves her. She gets a pass from everybody. So I was happy to see her back. And you, you know you don't like you don't you don't like Ons. You got a problem with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot about everyone else. Uh, Prakash Armitage, this has been a blast. I do have one last thing I want to get to. I know you, we always go back and forth with, you know, your love for film and media. So Nick Kyrgios and Ben still are going to be working together. And I need you to break that down on the Twitter spaces. If that, you know, I know the Twitter back and forth is great, but Kyrgios and Ben Stiller is something I think, you know, Netflix or one of these streaming services needs to film immediately. Uh, you could do, you could do a million different things with it. Um, I think if they did a film, it, it should definitely be a comedy. Even though Ben is well versed in anything that he wants to do, directing or acting, I think it should definitely be a comedy because Nick is absolutely hilarious. And the more straight he plays it, I think the funnier it'll be. And uh, I, I guess Ben doesn't speak very highly of his tennis game, but uh, I know he plays frequently. I know for a fact that Nick could certainly help him out with that. So as long as we get coverage of both Nick coaching Ben on the tennis court and then maybe Nick doing a little cameo on the acting side, I think we're all winners. Yeah, Curios as an actor is where I'm kind of like, well, how is this going to work? I'm more intrigued, I think, by that, but it could be. <laughs> I'm for sure more intrigued. Than that. I tell you what, if Stiller doesn't make it happen, regardless, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to put Curios in a movie sooner than later. Mark uh, my words. Mark marking, my words. I'm marking them. Well, Pr Prakash, you have picks for, you know, it sounds like we want, we're, you're going women's chalk, you know, Sabalenka and Iga seems to be the way. Yeah. Uh, men's side, any, any, takes or are you just going to sit back well you know before the tournament i i had djokovic and runa picked and it's look like, like i said I, it, this is very difficult because carlos really is my favorite my favorite guy to watch you know because he i've said this time and time again he reminds me of that time when when we were kids you know when you're nine ten years old before the world tells you what's realistic and what you can and can't do where you know, you just, you believe it's all possible. You know, when you're eight, when you're seven years old and you jump because you're trying to touch the moon, you actually believe that you can jump and touch the moon. You know, what a beautiful thing that is. I think that what I just described there is where Carlos plays from. You know, he, he says, as long as I'm smiling and I'm happy, I make that, that's how I choose my shots on the court. So I cannot explain how much I love this guy because he, he brings so much to my life and I'm just, I'm just a fan who enjoys watching it. And I know he does that for so many. Having said that, in this particular moment, I have chosen to go with Novak Djokovic as the winner. And let me tell you why. I, Carlos is going to be great, right? But Novak has been great for so long, right? Again, I'm going to use another line from Rocky. You know, uh, Apollo tells Rocky at the end of Rocky Three when they're fighting, he's like, let me tell you something, Stallion. Let me tell you something. You got to remember one thing. You fight great, but I'm a great fighter, you yeah. know? And I think that's a little bit of what it is right now. You know, Carlos, Carlos plays great, but this guy has been a great champion for, for decades. And, you know, uh, Novak still has not had that, that, and look, he's still very much in the mix, right? I mean, he, he was just ranked number one in the world, so he's still there. But I just feel like as, as champions are going out, right, you nice. have Tiger Woods winning the 2019 Masters. You have George Foreman beating Michael Moore at, at 40 years old. You have, uh, you know, Ali uh, beating uh, Foreman, Rumble in the Jungle, when absolutely no one on planet Earth thought he could ever do that, you know? And he came back and won it one more time. You, you have these champions that just... You know, do you have Brady winning the Super Bowl a couple of years ago when everyone thought he was done? You know, I don't think Novak has had that yet. I think Rafa may have had that last year when no one thought he could do what he did. Two sets of love down against Medvedev, then he wins the French. After that, I don't think we've seen that from Novak yet. Mm -hmm. So I still think he's got 
a little yeah. bit more while he's around number one in the world. And then maybe as he's going away, he squeezes out another one, you know? So for those reasons, I'm leaning towards, I know he's the underdog, by the way. I re- fully realize that, but I'm still, I'm still leaning towards uh, Medvedev. And um, bottom half, oh man, <laughs> how do I pick this one? Casper's the smart choice, for right. sure, for sure. But there's, there's something special happening with Sasha right now. You know, it's like he shouldn't be here, but all of a sudden in the last 10 days, He's remembering who he is, you know. Mm-hmm. He's remembering. Oh, I won the gold medal. Oh, I won two masters at the end of the year. I got five masters, one thousand. I'm one of the best clay quarters in the world. I got more power than this guy. So, on paper, it's probably sixty-five, thirty-five for Casper. But all intangibles concerned, I, th- I think it's a pick'em. I think it's a fifty-fifty between those two guys. Wow. When you were going to go with uh, Rocky Three quote, I thought it was going to be, you know, there is no tomorrow, screaming it a couple of times, or just pain as the prediction <laughs> for the match. But a lot of good I mean, those, <laughs> those are those are great. But I'm sticking with this one. I'm sticking with okay. this one. Hey, no, I, I will say though, yeah. both these guys, since we're on the topic of both these guys, everyone go take a look because Tennis Channel posted this, and I got it on my Instagram too. Right? Novak said it: to be the best, you got to beat the best, and Carlos said it. To beat the best, you got to beat the best. And I said this, that they both feel this way, Carlos in particular, when we were in Rome. I said, so to take a page out of the great Ric Flair's book, to be the man, you got to beat the man. Woo! It's it's perfect. And I love these generational <laughs> fights too, because one guy's like, I'm still the best. The other's like, nope, your time's over. It's mine. And there's one way to settle it. Goes without saying though, too, that if Novak wins this major, he passes Rafa for the first time in his career. He has more majors than anybody else. Big, big stakes, uh, historical stakes. I'm not here to argue the GOAT <laughs> because that's a different, that's a whole different three podcasts, but all them, all them Roger and Rafa uh, 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 aficionados, they, 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 they're going to be, they're going to be running out of arguments. You that know, would, if no back with this one. That would be three. He'd be the only three time win all slams. He'd, be, he'd have won every slam three times. That's a lot at stake. I can't wait to see it unfold. I wish it was Friday already. Uh, Prakash Armitrash, thank you so much for coming on Tennis Channel Insight. And always a pleasure. And it's always fun to watch you interview the stars as only you can. So thanks for making time and coming on the podcast. Big love, my guy. You do a fantastic job. Keep it up. <laughs>